major turning point in my life was when I stopped being afraid of dying. I used to think that I was my body. But if I look deeper, my body is made up of trillions of cells. And if I keep looking deeper, it's made up of trillions of atoms. And what are the atoms made up of? Nothing. They're just whirlpools in a sea of energy. And those aren't things at all. Science tells me virtually every cell in my body has been replaced. But Foster's been here all along. So my essential nature, by definition, by logic, must be metaphysical. So if I'm metaphysical, who says that I die when my physical body tires out and goes away? That's not only an intellectual understanding. For me, it was an experience that I'm actually an antenna in a field of energy, tapping guidance from it, and then bringing that into this body and into this physical world to fulfill my purpose. This is where science and spirit, physics and metaphysics, all came together and fueled my journey of exploring the innovations and the technologies that reflect this understanding. This blending of science and metaphysics has been a key topic in our lives for years. It's based on an understanding of energy, how it moves and interacts in the cosmos. I believe this interactive web of organized energy is exactly what Albert Einstein was seeking, but never found, the unified field. A universal fabric of energy that connects all life. The scientific story we've lived with for the past 300 years, based largely on the theories of Isaac Newton, has changed radically. Newton's universe operated like a machine with discrete matter moving through a vast emptiness of space and time with a separate human brain observing it. Looking at our cosmos as a connected field requires that we reconsider all that we've perceived as separate, which is essentially everything. As we come to understand this web of energy and how to relate to it harmoniously, we will finally have a way for all life on planet Earth, not just to survive, but to thrive. I'm Kimberly Carter Gamble. And I'm Foster Gamble. In 2011, Kimberly and I launched a film called Thrive, What on Earth Will It Take? The film has been translated into 27 languages and is now one of the most widely viewed documentaries in history. We connected the dots among seemingly disparate subjects, from an ancient cosmic code to cutting edge physics, from rigged banking and political schemes to the suppression of new energy holistic healing and UFO phenomena. We unpacked what's in the way of humanity thriving and solution strategies for correcting the dangerous mess we're in. The patterns we highlighted are even more relevant in the wake of the global response to COVID-19. After the movie came out, we heard from over a thousand innovators from all over the world scientists, inventors, medical doctors, and researchers who told us about their technologies, inventions, and insights. They claimed they had technologies that could do everything from cure cancer to access free energy, clean, abundant electricity source straight from space. We knew they wouldn't all be legitimate, but we also knew that if just a few were what they claimed, it could completely transform our world. So we put together teams of engineers and doctors and other experts to travel with us to Africa, China, 
Thailand, Egypt, all through Europe, Costa Rica, Mexico, and all over the United States to find out what they had. Our attention shifted from possibilities to results. We weren't looking to make a sequel to Thrive, but the breakthroughs we saw were so profound that we knew we had to get this information out for others to see. With a gorgeous, abundant planet, fundamentally good people, and advanced technology, why are we in such a lethal predicament? Is there something that we're not aware of yet, the knowing of which would actually transform the quality of life on Earth and have us thriving? Let's find out. There's a huge change that happens in civilization when they finally understand that there's a fundamental field that they're bathing in and that they can access it. This unified field can begin to explain where does the energy of a magnet come from? Where does the energy of a nuclei of an atom that's spinning it near the speed of light and perpetuity, where does that energy come from? I believe that we're very, very close to a true unified theory that is backed by consistent, relatable mathematics. And we've been trying very hard for a long time to define matter by studying matter. The characteristics of matter, the electron count, the proton count, the neutron count, all those things kind of come together. But what if the answer, the simple answer, is by understanding fully the vacuum? I've been studying the unified field and the phenomenon of accessing energy from it for more than 30 years. And since 1997, I've collaborated with cosmologist and inventor Nassim Harami. He's probably more aware of the physics of how the universe works than anyone I've ever met, even though he was not traditionally schooled. I've seen him ridiculed and shunned by the traditional academic world but I've just never seen him proven wrong. The space between you and I and the space between everything appears to be empty. We call it empty space commonly, but it's not. Space-time at the very specific scale of the Planck length is quantized with spherical units of Planck oscillators billions of times smaller than the atom. You can think of it as like a fluid that permeates all space. It's a source of the gravitational field. It's a source of the electromagnetic field. It's a source of mass. It's the source of charge. So now we're starting to really understand the mechanics of it at the deeper level. What is possible is extracting energy from the ubiquium. It's all here, it's right here. That energy is here. We're not violating any second law of thermodynamics. We believe that the, the background energy of everything around us is full of power. And in a very, very small area, there's enough power to power our society for thousands of years. I believe that the new level of physics, the new level of technology that's emerging in the world, that's extracting energy from the, the fundamental field, are technologies that are finding a way to create a resonance link to this fundamental field. I call the primary technology that I am developing to achieve gravity control the resonator. It is an instrument that's attempting to achieve high level of resonance coupling to the fundamental quantum field that's at the source of reality. Though the device is not finished yet, I think that they're working with the most advanced concept for accessing free energy from the unified field 
that I've ever seen or heard of. This device is built out of two coils that produces a magnetic field in the geometry of a double torus shape. And then it spins that field in coordinated rotation to create this singularity that hopefully couples to the vacuum. And that's what we believe it does to space time. Inside the coil is a crystal container, which is spherical, that has plasma in it. And the plasma is forced to rotate with the electromagnetic field structure as we power up the coil. So we're basically making a little star inside a crystal ball. The idea is that eventually we can start the field geometry in the plasma inside the crystal ball and get it rotating. And when it's self-sustaining, open the coil, remove that, that becomes a self-sustaining device that can be running a spaceship or your car or your house while making you healthy. Basically mimic what the universe does when it builds a star or when it builds a galaxy. The next step for humanity, the next step in our evolution, I really believe, is to understand gravity at a deeper level and learn to control it so that we can birth our civilization into a space civilization, into a space colony. We can explore our solar system, we can explore our galaxy and maybe even beyond. To me, resonance represents the new world that is emerging. Given how centralized energy can be used to manipulate and control people, and the dangerous and dirty ways corporations are extracting energy, we've been highly motivated to find alternatives. All the promising technologies we heard about were based on a common understanding that not only is everything energy, but that energy is always moving. That movement is called vibration, and frequency is the rate at which it's vibrating. When frequencies match in intensity, we get what's called resonance. We experience it as harmony. It sounds good and it feels good. According to quantum physics, the field is geometric in design and woven into predictable patterns. It unifies what are traditionally considered separate forces, and the organizing principles apply at every scale. The inventors we met were all operating on the understanding that the vacuum is not empty, and that stillness is not still. It's a dynamic of absolute balanced energy. When we bring together all the new discoveries and we take into consideration what they're telling us, it strongly suggests the existence of a geometric pattern. So when we see energy moving through this field, the energy is not moving haphazardly. It is following preferred pathways defined by the geometry of the field itself. Geometry is not just points, lines, and planes like I learned in school. It's about the push-pull relationship of energetic systems, like the pull between the Earth and the Sun, gravity, and the push out from the Sun, radiation. Pushing and pulling are essentially geometric phenomena, and lines and planes are just our conceptual representations of those dynamics. It's the predictability of this push and pull dynamic that allows the inventors to create replicable technologies. 
the geometry is all based on energy moving, and the shape of that movement is the torus. All of the projects reporting the best results were toroidal in design. This is because the torus is the basic pattern that energy takes throughout the entire cosmos. The torus looks like a donut. The energy flows in through one end, circulates around the center, and exits out the other end. Like a whirlpool in a stream, it's made from the medium in which it exists and is at the same time discrete within it. It's both distinct and unified and demonstrates why something could appear separate from something else and from the field while still being connected to it. It's self-sustaining at every scale. Picture the eye of a hurricane. At the center of every torus is a point of stillness. The field is basically a sea of toruses, each one touching its 12 identical neighbors, like a stack of oranges. Connecting the center, or still point, of each torus with its nearest neighbors reveals equal non-physical lines of force, or vectors. It's what visionary inventor and futurist Buckminster Fuller called the vector equilibrium. When this balanced state of equilibrium is extended without boundaries, it reveals that infinite fabric of space-time that Fuller called the IVM, or the isotropic vector matrix. It just means the same in all directions. This is the web of life force that the inventors say is the source of the energy that they're tapping. Life as we know it arises through contraction and expansion, pulling and pushing. It finds stability in symmetries, sixfold, fivefold, fourfold, threefold. This pulsation of energy is what Bucky Fuller called the jitterbug, the dance of the cosmos. Fuller humbly noted on his poster that this dynamic may come to be identified as the unified field. So what is the unified field unifying? This is what Einstein was seeking until the day he died. He was looking for the unifying insight that reconciles the four supposedly separate forces in the universe, electromagnetism, the strong and weak nuclear forces, and gravity. According to emerging unified field theory, the dynamic of the torus provides this reconciliation. Electricity and magnetism used to be seen as separate forces, and we now know they're part of one dynamic called electromagnetism. Understanding this unification was what enabled Michael Faraday to invent the electric motor. What if gravity and the strong and weak forces are not separate, but are also part of the toroidal dynamic? What new technologies can emerge from that understanding? Nassim Haramein has postulated that gravity and the strong and weak nuclear forces are dynamics of how energy moves in the toroidal flow. In this light, gravity is a function of a whole field of infinitesimal spinning toruses being drawn towards larger concentrations of toruses that make up larger masses, as the moon is pulled to the earth and the earth is drawn to the sun. Haramein suggests protons are really mini black holes whose spin creates attraction between them 
despite the repulsion we would expect from their positive charge. This attraction is what is referred to as the strong force. From this perspective, what's referred to as the weak force is the result of the natural fluctuations of the nucleus, emanating waves into the field. Unifying the four forces reminds me of the fabled blind men holding onto different parts of the elephant and describing it as a rope or a tree or a snake. The elephant in this case is the toroidal energy dynamic of the unified field. Using the smallest measure, a single wave of light he calls the Planck spherical unit, and postulating that its form is toroidal, Paramin predicted that this dynamic is operating at every scale. By applying this hypothesis, he was able to determine the mass of all the elements and predicted the radius of protons and electrons, while also showing this understanding of the spin of the unified field as the source of mass, gravity, charge, and many physical constants. All of this with unprecedented accuracy. Why does the proton matter? The proton is matter. Everything we see in our reality is what we call matter. If we understand the proton, then most likely that understanding will be correct at larger scale, and that's what we're finding. So it really tells us about our reality and how it got here and how it works. Paramin developed a new scaling law showing the toroidal shape of systems throughout the universe. His work correlates with the notion of a grand nested hierarchy. There is one pattern at all scales, from Planck spherical units, within protons, within atoms, to molecules, within cells, organisms, within planets, solar systems within galaxies, within a vast field of galactic clusters. When Italian astronomers were searching to see if there was a predictable pattern to how galaxies cluster, they found what they call the egg carton universe. This pattern is identical to what we are discovering at all scales as the fabric of space-time. The way to access this source field of energy appears to be through stillness, sometimes called the zero point. Stillness is not static. It's a state of harmonic resonance, a rhythmic, balanced interchange of energy. With energy frequencies, the state of complete balance functions like a straw intersects with the stillness at the center of each torus in the field, tapping into its pure potential. Stillness is a portal for accessing boundless electricity, developing healing technologies, expanding consciousness, or simply finding peace of mind. Energy moving creates sound, only some of which is in our human range of hearing. The unified field theory proposes that sound waves at different frequencies 
are what shape energy from the field into matter. We can see this phenomenon unfold in nature when sound waves interact with any form of matter, for example, fluid or sand. Acoustic pressure reliably creates specific, predictable patterns. In fact, music seems to be the master key to understanding the unified field. Life is an acoustic reality, a sea of sound waves, and what we call music is how it's organized. Music is not something that people created. It's something that we discovered to work with because it already existed in the universe. Every planet has a unique audio signature. There's a beautiful recording of the sound of the magnetic field of our Earth being strummed like the strings of a guitar by the solar wind that is coming from our sun. And when NASA took the satellite recordings and they bumped it into the audible range, it became possible for us to actually hear the song of Earth's magnetic fields. Energy waves at all scales follow the same harmonic principles as music, octaves, intervals, and tuning. Tuning is when two or more frequencies come into harmonic resonance. Tuning a guitar uses the same principles as the inventors are using to create health and energy technologies. They all spoke of tuning their devices to achieve a state of perfect balance. Tuning ourselves to resonate with how the universe works gives us a way to come into harmony with one another and with our planetary home. Music literally is the universal language, universe, one song. The insight that the cosmos unfolds with predictable order provides a revolutionary context for reality itself. Elegant, mathematical, harmonious, like a symphony.
There's a saying that someone with good health wants many things, and someone who's sick wants just one. Being healthy is not just a personal prerequisite, as became painfully clear with the pandemic-induced collapse of 2020. It's the fulcrum for the economy of communities, countries, the whole world. Along with energy inventors, we were contacted by doctors and healers who reported phenomenal results using energy in the form of sound and light waves to promote healing. According to quantum physics, sound waves are what shape matter. Our bodies are matter. So it makes sense that sound frequencies could also impact us. I traveled the world investigating how these new insights into vibration, frequency, and resonance are transforming our understanding of biology and health. Health to me is clear communication between an individual and the unified field. We have billions of chemical reactions happening in each of our trillions of cells every second. And they're happening in a coordinated manner, sometimes faster than the speed of light. What's responsible for that communication and coordination and connection? The field. Humanity has been given an idea that there are two realms to the universe, a physical, mechanical realm, the material things that we see, as well as an invisible realm. In a Newtonian world, only physical things can affect a physical body, and that led to the development and evolution of the pharmaceutical industry, which sells chemicals to affect our body. And then we find out from quantum physics that energy signals are profoundly more effective in controlling biology than in matter. Chemistry, by its definition, is always associated with side effects. They're not side effects, they're direct effects. 300,000 people die every year in America from taking prescription drugs. If you're sitting around a table with three women, one of you is taking an antidepressant. We have half of Americans today opening up to four prescription bottles every day. But when you learn more about what the evidence actually suggests, around how well these medications really work and how potentially harmful they can be, you might begin to think, ah, oh, there could be a better way. If instead of suppressing symptoms, our goal is healing, what would be different? All of the health innovators who I met related to the body with respect and to symptoms with curiosity, it's feedback. What's our body telling us is out of order? So to these healers, just suppressing a symptom is actually cutting off a much needed source of information because they look to get at the cause of a problem rather than just stop the effects of there being a problem. I certainly don't mean to imply that your allopathic doctor doesn't want you to get well or that there's no use for conventional medicine. It's good for all kinds of things. It's that the doctors don't even have access to the full range of options. Early diagnosis and self-help natural and energy-based cures don't benefit the pharmaceuticals. And pharmaceutical companies are the ones funding the medical education and influencing regulatory approvals and laws. What conventional doctors are taught and have access to is all funneled through the same centralized control matrix. Our life expectancy has fallen over the last few years for the first time in history. And now, if you look at the life expectancy in the United States compared to other countries, we're 30th. We have the highest incidence of depression, obesity, yet we're spending more per capita on healthcare than any other nation in the world. 
The new science is based on energy, energy medicine. You can heal with energy much more effectively than you can heal with chemistry. I was able to see hundreds of people treated with the whole range of energy-based technologies, including one that uses a cord of frequencies to create a still point which appears to elicit powerful healing effects. It was developed by Dr. Todd Ovakaitis. At the level of physics, we know that the cells are always vibrating. In a sense, they're always singing a type of song. That song is the sum of all the vibrations of all the molecules in that particular tissue. So we had found a vibrational pattern that was somehow in resonance with the stem cell-like cells that caused them to intensely go where the beam had been. The theory is that each kind of cell has a distinct energetic signature that can be matched. And this technology appears to have found a way to do just that. I asked Dr. Beth McDougall to demonstrate what she thought was happening with this photoacoustic device. In order to really talk about how this instrument is affecting changes in the body, I'd like to talk a little bit about V-cells. V-cells, or V-S-E-Ls, stand for very small embryonic-like cells. These are dormant stem cells that have been present in your body since the time you were forming as an embryo. This photoacoustic technology seems to hold the key to unlock the dormant DNA in these cells. Well, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's three years ago, and my experience of it up to then had been seeing my father suffer from it in the 70s and 80s. It was really the end of his productive life, and I was devastated to feel that that might be my fate as well. The results have been really life-changing. I got my body back and I got my mind back. My father had Parkinson's for 27 years and watching what he went through was one of the hardest things in my life. To see this guy's face and imagining what it would have been like for my father, to be able to restore his body and his mind. Now I just feel really grateful knowing the millions of people whose lives will go forward in ways that my father wasn't able to experience. The earlier that we can detect and decode symptoms of an illness, the easier it is to remedy the underlying cause. Historically, acupuncturists listened to a patient's voice to help with diagnosis. Two inventors I met are now running the voice through complex machine learning algorithms to detect imbalance in specific organs. They then identify the vibrational signatures of the deficient minerals or vitamins and feed those vibrations back into the body as sound waves through a headset. All of the nervous impulses in the body are coming together through the vagus nerve and are being emitted by the voice, which is like the speaker, where the nerves are like the speaker wire. All of that information creates vibrational imprints within the vocal cords when you're speaking. We have greater and greater understanding. Because we are able to detect conditions of disharmony prior to a physical condition manifesting in the body, we can empower people to start taking care of themselves while they're still healthy so that they never have to get sick. When you go to your doctor, there's not a often that they ask you if you're in tune. They listen to you with a stethoscope, make sure your heart's beating. They listen for your lungs, but they're not seeing if your heart and your lungs are all running in the same resonance. Our technology is really there to provide a way to do that, to look at the body in this holistic way and see where you're out of harmony and where you're out of tune and provide a way to actually bring the body back into resonant harmony. In my travels, I came across a team who reported fabulous results remedying all kinds of diseases by alkalizing the cellular environment. I had heard from a friend about a place his mom had gone where she healed from stage four metastasized cancer. 
He said, she's not the only one. And when I got there, I saw the evidence. Hello. Hey, hi, hi. hi. The largest organ of the human body is called the interstitium, and it contains 60% of our body fluids. And this is what needs to be measured, both in its pH and its chemistry, in order to determine the actual health of the human body. So why doctors use only information from the blood for the diagnosis and completely ignore interstitial fluid? Dr. Galina Megalko and Robert Young use a combination of live blood cell, thermogram, sonogram, and other modalities. One device Dr. Megalko uses is the bioelectric scan, which measures the electrical charge of cell fluid. When we do interstitial fluid scans, which is the electrical potential of your cells, we'll look at it like your battery on your phone. The vitality of the charge reveals a lot about the cell's capacity to communicate. Salt is an electrical conductor, and cells communicate through electrical impulses. According to Dr. Megalko and Young, disease, including cancer, arises when the fluid in the interstitium loses its alkalinity, its salt and minerals, and becomes too acidic for the cells to communicate effectively to stay in balance. Cancer is not a disease of the cells, but it's a condition of the cells as an expression of what's happening in the internal fluids of the body. So cancer can be explained as a condition. So I like to use it as an adjective. Cancer is a cancerous condition of the cell. This team's treatment is simple, affordable, and it has spectacular results. People came to Young Center from all over the world based on word of mouth. Out of more than 320 people using this protocol, 96% successfully resolved stages one, two, and three cancers, and 81% successfully reversed their stage four cancer. I was diagnosed in February of 2012 with stage three breast cancer. I came to the ranch and within two weeks I'd lost 15 pounds and my tumor that was at 3.18 reduced in size to 1.1. After nine weeks, my tumor was completely gone. It took me about three months to reverse the colon cancer and the esophageal cancer. Seeing these amazing results I wondered what Dr. Young would see with my blood. I ate well and exercised for most of my life, but I had been feeling really tired for a few weeks, and I was noticing I often felt dizzy when I stood up. So I was just a simple little, that's it. There it is. You're showing irregular patterns in this part of the body. They're irregularly shaped like this, yeah. which is a cancer profile. Okay, that doesn't mean you have cancer, right. but we see it years in advance, okay? So that's what makes this test so powerful because we see something that's happening prior to the actual, you know, right. realization, like say it shows up on an MRI or a CAT scan. Right. I was shocked to see how unhealthy my blood looked. I realized I had never even considered the salt mineral balance in my body. I started taking the salt, and within a few months, my blood was significantly improved. I'm happy to say my little red blood cells are no longer deformed or clumped. My energy's back, and I still do a very strict alkaline diet and drink the salt and minerals every day. So there's a real challenge here. The notion of somebody else prescribing a magic pill so that I can just keep barreling ahead can be tempting but there are no magic pills. I can still be super healthy and feel great. I just need to watch what I eat, I have to exercise, I need to pay attention to what I'm thinking and catch any imbalance early and deal with it. It's like, whoa, this great, healthy, vital life actually requires something of me. It's the same with peace of mind. 
we actually have to do something to find clarity and maintain inner balance. So how do the dynamics of the unified field help us with that? Consciousness is information. Consciousness is a living, breathing compendium or library of information that is informing the entire field around us. Not just here in front of us, locally, but distally as well. That that consciousness has an organization. It has a pattern to it. So throughout history, the field has been called many names, such as the web, spirit, it's been called the source, the one, the divine matrix, it's been called consciousness, God. These are shared in poetic terms thousands of years ago, but they're actually very accurately describing what the best science of the modern world is now discovering. We are in constant communication with this field. There's a dialogue that we may or may not recognize. We are speaking to the field and the field is responding to us every moment of every day of our lives. On my trips through Central America, I encountered scientists, healers, and shamans who described interacting with the unified field to heal the mind and transform consciousness. For them, vibration, frequency, and resonance are tools for freeing us from our limiting beliefs and expanding our sense of what's possible. With their guidance, I experienced viscerally that the field was not something outside of me, but a living force within me. Consciousness actually evolves according to the same predictable principles and patterns that characterize the field. One of Foster's mentors, Arthur Young, not only invented the Bell helicopter, he also discovered a roadmap for how consciousness evolves throughout nature. Arthur Young's theory of process covers the entire sweep of evolution in seven stages. In his book, The Reflexive Universe, The Evolution of Consciousness, he outlines how evolution is a process put in motion by purpose. A primal spark of consciousness from a field of pure potential begins to acquire new powers. From the push and pull dynamics of the subatomic realm to the acquiring of identity as atoms that then combine into molecules, each formation meeting the challenge to take the next step. It was when the molecule mastered temperature, a way to balance its inner and outer environments as cells, that life as we know it was born, a game changer. When cells mastered growth, plants were born. Then life, mastering mobility, created animals. And then, meeting the challenge of self-awareness became human, became us. At each stage, a new challenge and a new capacity. Our human challenge, like that of the molecule, is to balance our inner and outer worlds, to come into harmony with ourselves, with each other, and with our environment. I believe that when we pass this test, what awaits us is a new freedom and creativity, the likes of which we can hardly imagine. Purpose is what drives the whole story. This is why knowing our purpose and aligning it with the dynamics of the field is so important. It can help us transcend the human conflicts that have taken us to the brink of self-destruction. 
Over the years, we've found powerful tools for evolving human consciousness. One of the most direct ways to tune ourselves to the field is with brainwave biofeedback. For many years, I worked with Dr. James Hart and his BioCybernaut technology. We did neural feedback research and training, teaching people how to reduce stress and to increase focus, healing, and intuition by getting real-time feedback on the frequencies of their brain. The brain waves of most mammals including humans, resonate at a particular frequency when at rest, but still alert. We're riding on a wave that scientists call the Schumann resonance, a frequency field surrounding the planet, vibrating at around eight cycles per second. It's sometimes called the heartbeat of the Earth. It's like a still point, a portal between our inner and our outer worlds. Time and again, we observed yogis, Zen and Qigong masters, and proven psychics as they passed through that portal, remained awake and aware, and changed their states of consciousness the way most of us would switch channels on our TV. Dr. Hart's research shows that anyone can cultivate this ability to move between various brainwave states at will. It's a matter of practice. The notion that we're in a constant dialogue with the field helps explain how virtually all the scientists, doctors, philosophers, and shamans we met described getting profound insights, what they call downloads, in dreams, meditation, near-death experiences, or times of extreme focus. Others throughout history attribute information coming through in this way for such far-reaching inspirations as Elias Howe's invention of the sewing machine, German chemist Friedrich Kekulé's discovery of the structure of the benzene molecule, Walter Russell's prediction of previously unknown atomic elements, and Paul McCartney's song Yesterday. Virtually everyone I've asked reports similar experiences in their own life. For centuries, people have used meditation and prayer to access deeper awareness and connection to the divine. The silence and stillness required for achieving these states mirrors the process of accessing the field through the still point. Just as with energy and health technologies, personal stillness works like a straw to draw on the unified field and bring its infinite possibilities into our lives. Someone who's profoundly helped me to become more adept at finding my own stillness is my dear friend and teacher, Mitra Politi. Meditation and prayer. In the essence of it, they are leading to the same place. It's a connection with source. And then there is a equilibrium. There is a meeting point between the divinity of the field to the divinity of oneself. Within meditation, for me, there is few major benefits. One is to reflect where I'm at with my actions and with my thoughts and with my feelings. Second, to bring a more soft dialogue between me and myself. And eventually to connect back to the Creator, to connect back to all that there is. Through that process, there is a thin uh, zero point. It's the sound of silence that puts everything back into the place. You know? That is a great practice to, to bring to anything. That is a great practice to, to have as an ally. It's a great practice to keep us evolving in the right direction. There's a lot of evidence that the field is responsive to the power of attention as well as to the power of intention. Two guides I met along my travels were Regan Hillier and Juan Pablo Barahona who take a whole systems approach to helping people manifest what they want in their lives. 
in the activation work that we do, it all starts from within. The more we expand our field and the more permeable we are to be in resonance, in vibration with the field that is around us, the more we can flow in synchronicity. It is a process of seven stages related to the physical body, the mind, the emotions, the energy that flows through our nervous system and through our energy centers, and how that relates to the magnetic field that we emanate. We don't always get in life what we dream about, but we do get what we tolerate. You see, if everyone got what they dream about, then everyone's dreams would instantly be here right now. But we do receive our minimum standard. That's a guarantee. So when I'm working with people, I'm always asking them, what's your dream? What's your vision? And we're connecting with that. But then we're looking at what is your current reality? Because your current reality is a direct reflection of everything that you're tolerating right now. When we look around the world at our current reality, what are we tolerating? Why? Getting in touch with what's possible and tuning ourselves to a greater resonance have beckoned humanity throughout the ages. One method used all over the world is breath meditation. With each breath, we literally draw the life force of the field into our bodies. So many of us have no idea how we're breathing at all. And the number one way that we can control our experience is to pay attention to our breath. Fear, sadness, stress, all of these things that cause illness or even just like physical pain, all of that, those are like low frequency energies that we carry in our field. So just by using your breath, by bringing in more oxygen, you kind of create this high frequency circuit that literally can change your electromagnetic field. When I was in Central America checking out health technologies, I visited an extraordinary healing center called Rhythmia where I was introduced to plant medicine. For thousands of years, indigenous people have used various plant medicines, including ayahuasca. When ingested in a sacred ceremony, these natural substances can create an altered state of consciousness that's conducive to physical, emotional, and spiritual breakthroughs. One thing that separates us from lots of other retreat centers and plant medicine facilities and resorts is that we have a medical license. The benefit is that it puts people at great ease. And the whole goal of plant medicine is to let people relax enough to hear their soul. When I listened to the shamans at Rhythmia describe what they were doing, I remember later telling Foster, it was like I was listening to the energy inventors. They were using exactly the same terms, vibration, frequency, and resonance. It was wild. En las curaciones, digamos, cuando nosotros estamos en una conexión con los espíritus y la naturaleza, es una frecuencia muy alta. Entonces, cuando nosotros hacemos las curaciones, nos centramos, digamos, en esa frecuencia. Como todo es energía, entonces nosotros llegamos a ese principio de origen, donde desde ahí nosotros miramos muchos patrones. Así mismo nosotros hacemos los cantos, las curaciones para limpiar todo, digamos, todo el campo energético para que todo de ahí para adelante sea hermoso, algo dulce, digamos, para la vida. As my teacher explains, we humans were based on sound, we're energy. So when we do healing, there's a block in the frequency, something's not matching up. And when we apply the song or the prayer, there's the counter frequency there to bring balance or resonance within that person's energetic field. 
During the journey with the plant medicine, the reorganizing is happening first, so it can come in shape, in color, it can come as understanding, it can come as a death and rebirth process, it can come as a vision and insight. And there is always a subtle dialogue between challenge and awakening. My experience with ayahuasca transformed my relationship with my mother, with my children, and most of all, the medicine showed me that none of us is ever alone, that expanded consciousness is always available, waiting to be our most exquisite, loving dance partner. I realized that science, spirituality, and ancient wisdom all converge in the unified field. The same ingenuity and radical thinking that we experienced in the realms of health and consciousness, we also encountered in the world of energy. The inventors who claimed they had engineered devices that could provide limitless, clean energy described their work with the same terms as the healers and shamans. Vibration, frequency, resonance. All characteristics of interacting with the unified field. By looking at mathematics and music and art and science, physics, as all part of one continuum of awareness and understanding, we can tackle the big problems. Understanding the musical and mathematical nature of the cosmos opens up a whole new way of thinking. A great example of this is an unlikely inventor that we found deep in the jungles of Costa Rica, Hart Akerson. 
The way I learned to think was with music. So when you're thinking in musical terms, you're thinking in another structure, and that structure could open up other doors that are not accessible through verbal or word-based communication. The core issue of our whole civilization, the core reason for non-sustainability comes from centralization. They have centralized education, centralized control of language, centralized dictionaries, centralized government, centralized religion, and centralized energy. You turn on a light switch in your house, you click the switch, the light comes on. What really happened? What really happened is maybe 100 miles away, there's a large generator producing enough electricity for hundreds of thousands of houses. It comes out of that generator and gets transmitted with wires at probably 100,000 volts. Then it goes into your house, through your breaker box, through the meter that the grid company has there, and goes through your switch, which has just completed the circuit, so that it can go through your light bulb and make the light come on. That requires an enormous amount of maintenance and capital expense to do that. So now we're contrasting it to a house that has a transverter solar system. That means in the utility room, there's some electronic boxes with transverter stuff in them, and there's some batteries, and the roof, there's some solar panels, and you also have a connection to the grid. So when you throw that switch, it completes the circuit, but it comes right from the transverter. But it immediately has access to the energy from its batteries, the solar panels, the grid, and maybe your next door neighbor. The grid's importance all of a sudden is, has been demoted. It's just one of many possible sources. We discovered that there are three main categories in the field of energy that we need to solve as a species. One of them is generation of energy, how we get it. Another is transmission of energy, how to get it from one place to another. And the third one is integration of energy, how to get it into the existing grid. Hart's work is the best example we've found in the area of integration. His technology takes solar, wind, geothermal, or these various so-called free energy technologies and adapts them to homes or to local grids with what he calls the Hart Transverter. The reason I got the transverter system installed was because the power here fluctuates quite a bit and there's a lot of power outages as well. And also having the energy security, knowing that you know even when the power grid went out, we always had our essential electricity was running. Now we run two houses with a number of refrigerators, a pool pump, fans, even air conditioning. But we have a power purchase agreement as well, so any excess power we get credit for. So our electricity bills now run at about $10 a month, It's just, which is just the rental for the meter. So there aren't really any bills. It's a microgrid node, so it's capable of sharing with its neighbors, and its neighbors can cluster together in larger microgrids and share with other clusters. So you're doing it from the bottom up. Your core thing is the individual home, and it can work up to where you support an entire civilization. It's kind of like a fractal. You've got a group at the home. You've got a bigger cluster of these. And it could cover the whole city of Boston. It could cover the whole United States. It could do our whole planet. 
We can't move from where we are today to 100% renewable energy with the grid system that we have. Renewable energy fluctuates too much, so it collapses and affects the grid in a negative way. Now, Hart has created something where we can actually transition from where we are today to 100% renewable energy without negatively affecting the power grid. And just knowing that we're part of that movement has been quite profound for me. We got to come up with solutions that we can implement, like yesterday. One of the principles of the field is that it's infinitely dispersed. Decentralization is aligned with that principle. We heard about these two brothers, James and Kenneth Corum, who have spent the last 20 years working on energy transmission. Their aim was to reconstruct the technology behind Nikola Tesla's Wardenclyffe Tower, which was built to transmit energy wirelessly. That tower was destroyed by Tesla's financier, J.P. Morgan, who realized that wireless transmission would obsolete copper wiring and undermine the profits from his own copper mines. Tesla was using the work of a man named Zenit, who discovered a wave that travels almost instantaneously in the field around our planet. It follows the surface of the Earth, and when it moves, it doesn't have any harmful effects on human beings. Tesla was looking to ride the Zenic wave to transmit both energy and communications. The Corum brothers have apparently now recreated that technology with modern materials and achieved what Tesla had set out to do. You'll be able to put an antenna on your car that will just tap the field for electricity. You'll be able to put one on your home or your local power station. That energy can be tapped by an ocean liner crossing the sea with an antenna on top without burning any polluting fuels. The Zenic technology is the best one we found for transmitting energy in a low cost and healthy way. These innovations in energy integration and transmission are brilliant and make it possible to keep a lot of our existing infrastructure in place. Of course, we also really need clean energy sources that are decentralized and affordable for them to transmit and integrate. Tapping into a field of infinite energy would do so much to improve the actual daily lives of all of us everywhere on this planet. That's why we've spent so much of our time and resources investigating inventors who claimed breakthroughs in the generation of energy. One promising energy source comes from hydrogen. It's the most abundant element in the entire universe. It's essentially everywhere. The key to hydrogen is that when it's ignited, it creates heat, and the heat can be transferred into power. So if we can do that efficiently and inexpensively, then we can use it to run our cars, our factories, or an entire community. It could substitute for dirty coal and repurpose the 15,000 plus coal plants that are wreaking havoc with the earth, the miners, and the people living nearby. It could also replace nuclear and fracking. But currently, extracting hydrogen from water is too expensive to be a viable option. In Thailand, however, we found a guy who claimed his team had discovered a way to access hydrogen for fuel absolutely cleanly and for virtually nothing. The inventor himself does not do media appearances, but he authorized one of his technicians who built the device to give us a tour. There's a gas in the water you can burn, so you can make a fire out of water. This inventor apparently has found a way to use earth minerals in a pressurized vortex to access pure hydrogen cheaply and efficiently. We found an easy way to make hydrogen. You don't need a big fancy uh, electrolysis factory. We find a system where the hydrogen comes out from a kind of chemical reaction. We have some special mix. The device that they've created to extract hydrogen is as beautiful as any energy technology I've ever seen. They've found the secret of how to catalyze a reaction in this compound that then just gives off essentially free hydrogen. 
We asked ourselves the question, what does the world need? We think hydrogen is the best way to solve this problem. I was encouraged by the hydrogen device still under development. And what also really excited me were the technologies for extracting energy directly from the field. For over 20 years, I've searched the world for working free energy devices. A really common objection to even the notion of a free energy device is that it can't be, because physics has certain proven laws, and this would be in violation of that. So if in fact there is a device that is running without being plugged into anything for long periods of time such that it proves that it's accessing energy from somewhere else, then either the law is wrong or the law is misunderstood. And I think, for the most part, the law is misunderstood. The first law of thermodynamics states that an isolated energy producing system can't generate more energy than goes into it. This may be correct within closed systems, but atoms, suns, galaxies, and the cosmos itself, like the magnet on your refrigerator, are open systems. The successful devices we are seeing are specifically designed as open, not isolated systems. So the limitations of the first law don't apply when it comes to accessing energy from one realm to another. I learned about a young man in Africa who claimed to have built a car, a generator, and even a helicopter that ran on radio frequencies, a true free energy device that keeps batteries consistently charged. It took me several months to find him, but when I did, it blew my mind. I knew it would be complicated because these things always are. Going to Zimbabwe, the Ethiopian airline that we had tickets with had just had a major crash and a cyclone had just ravaged the area, leaving hundreds dead. Well, we're sitting in a hotel in Harare, Zimbabwe this morning. We're here today to start the vetting process and find out, okay, what, what's real? Over 95% of the time, these things aren't what they claim to be. This time we took engineer Nils Rognerud to assist with the vetting. When Nils and I arrived and met Maxwell, I was very impressed with just what a gentle, true-seeming soul he was. And then the next morning, we went to see the device, and he gave us a full tour. I was practically ecstatic. It was such a beautiful, elegant device. What we're looking at is called the green power of grid machine. It is half a megawatt and we are relying with the radio frequency. The highness radio frequency converted into pure energy that is useful. It is called a microsonic energy device. A microsonic energy device, it is the generator in this machine. For people who are not familiar with this, half a megawatt, how much will that power in terms of a house or a community or what? We are talking of about 300 uh, standard house homes, yeah. Okay. that you can power with one machine. So there's no oil burning, there's no fires going on or anything, so, wh wh where, wh so where's the energy coming from? We're harnessing it straight away from the, the, na the natural energy that God has just put in the, in, in, in our, on our earth, yeah, the radio frequency. So nothing unusual, but the main point is that a meter away, there's no frequencies being transmitted from a, a microwave tower uh, next to the park we're standing in. It's a poignant day for us here. And amidst the excitement of seeing this for the first time, a couple of strangers showed up on the site where we were being shown these devices. And Maxwell, the inventor, took us aside as soon as he could and said, these guys are from the government and I didn't know they were coming. Unfortunately, we're, we're truly concerned about this gentleman and we're just gonna take every precaution that we can to keep ourselves safe, to keep him safe, and to keep this knowledge safe. The microphone we had on Maxwell picked up the conversation that he had with one of the officials. So we quickly got the tape translated and found out that the government official was promising Maxwell a power purchase agreement 
where the government would pay him for generating energy for the country. It was good corroboration that they believed he had what he claimed. Although Maxwell didn't trust him because the government had already put him in prison in an effort to steal his technology. In fact, when Maxwell was put in prison, he was put in a cell with one of the richest guys in Zimbabwe, a man named Genius. That's his real name. Whom the government had jailed to extort more money from. Maxwell was in great despair and praying for like five or six hours at a time. It was driving Genius crazy. And he was saying, why are you praying so much? Shut up. Finally, they ended up talking and Genius was impressed and said, okay, I'll help you, man. It was the most unlikely, couldn't have scripted it way for Maxwell to be able to have somebody on his team with real business savvy and support. And it was forged right there in prison. I love that. So when you're in, the, when you're in prison, Maxwell was praying every, you know, now and then. So I'm asking, but why do you pray like that? It's too much. From the time I have known him, I've learned a lot from him. He sees people. I think the way God sees people. I think you saw it when you were driving. People can just block his way. Not to attack him, but everyone likes him. If you just deal with the right people, me and Maxwell will take this to another level. We were feeling very excited about our progress with Maxwell and hoped that we would soon be able to conduct a thorough vetting of the device. However, we started running into issues. Suspicions of our motives and intentions were starting to circulate amongst Maxwell's advisors. So Maxwell sent this note saying, Hi Foster, we have talked and I'm advised that the further tests you requested won't be possible because of a number of issues such as, one, where it's intended to be used if on investors. The single most important thing of all this to me is we do the duration test so we find out, do we think that this technology is real as claimed or not? Absolutely. Call declined. Okay then. So I'm trying to get in touch with Maxwell because we're down to our last day once again. In the next few hours, we need to make a decision. Are we going to change reservations once again and stay over, which is going to be a, a real hit on our budget. But this is what it takes. And is he ultimately, consciously or subconsciously, trying to, to get it so that we either have to leave, we just can't wait around any longer so we don't get the to the result we came for, and we don't get to expose some potential problem with the thing. I don't know. I don't know either. For me, the low point of that whole trip to Zimbabwe was when we had been waiting in the hotel room for a number of days, and we were getting these texts with kind of false accusations and suspicions and then one came in and said, when's your plane? You should just go. That was like the moment of, okay, he's not just stalling. He's saying, go away. So that's when I really had to search deep inside myself for, can I put up with this? <laughs> Do I think he has the capability to actually come around? But both of those things get resolved for me. And I don't know if he's gonna come around, but I know that I'm true. His suspicions are false, so that if I can just hang in there and actually get into reality again with him, at least we've got a shot. And I pictured being on the plane, going home with a complete failure, and not knowing, and the possibility that this was maybe the best energy device I've ever seen, and we got kicked out based on misunderstandings. That was so much more horrible to me than the obnoxious need to wait and the expenses that were being accrued in the process of it. Just when our hope was beginning to fade, we received a text from Maxwell. He was ready for us to conduct a full vetting of the device. We're not sure what had changed, but we were excited and ready to go. 
One final hurdle was finding some additional batteries the inventor needed for the test. Okay, so we're trying to come up with enough money to buy the rest of the batteries that the inventor needs to do the test this afternoon before we're supposed to leave tomorrow. Max explained that the energy tapped from radio frequencies runs through batteries, so the batteries don't lose their charge, but you still need them for the process. Found another envelope in the safe. This is uh, Zimbabwe petty cash. We have another $90, folks. <laughs> Biggest boss. <laughs> Biggest How friend. You Thank you so much for helping us out today. This is this is the big day. Yeah, what we're doing today will be so important for Maxwell and for you with other people who are interested in the technology. Ultimately, they need to know that it lasts long enough to prove what the device does. And then also, Nils will be measuring the voltage of the batteries during the test, and that will reveal whether it's what he has claimed or not. So I'm sitting here in Mr. Genius's office. We've just taken the next step toward getting this bedding done because they didn't have the right batteries. They didn't have enough batteries in the device to do the duration test that we need. The inventor did not have enough cash to buy all the new batteries. So we needed to get cash, and you cannot get cash out of banks or currency shops or anything in, in Zimbabwe right now. So fortunately, Mr. Genius said, come to my office and we can swipe a credit card and get you the cash, and take you over and get you the batteries. So uh, that transaction has taken place with a, a little extra drama. We're home free to the next step anyway. Big Blue started at 4.36 p.m. We're here with Maxwell, and the test is starting. Once we arrived on site, our goal for the vetting was to establish that the device could power a welding machine, which uses a lot of electricity very quickly, for long enough that it couldn't be running on batteries alone. So you were asking where the energy came from. You mentioned the other day the sun, but it's not like solar energy. I know right? it's yeah. not. We're not using solar energy because this one is not even affected with clouds, light, and things right. like that. It just work. So the the energy, the the radio frequencies that you're harnessing, yeah. th are they there in space in the field all the time? Yes, they are. From the first day we started to test the machine, we have been analyzing and we saw that the radio frequency is there. But one thing that we want to know for sure is, is it alien or is it, it man-made from another planet or <laughs> is it from God? That's where we need, I think, scientifically, scientific people to define exactly. But we know the radio frequency, we have everything. If it's still a fully charged battery, the test is successful. It's not screws. Oh, that's 217. That's, that's perfect. We get it. So that's the, that's the 18 batteries. Yeah, that's the 18 batteries. Oh, yeah. So that's higher than the nominal voltage. <laughs> Dude! <laughs> wow! Thank you so much. That is awesome. That's the 18 uh, volt batteries. So it has higher voltage. <laughs> Thank you. Give us two thumbs up. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> One final check of the battery voltage revealed a shocking result. Not only had the machine outlasted the expected battery life, but the batteries were still fully charged. This proved that the device was being powered from an unknown energy source. <laughs> thank you. This is one of the happiest days of my life. Thank you. And I am so proud of this man who has gone through so much. He's listened to the voice of the divine coming through him, and he's done whatever it takes to bring this through for humanity. So congratulations, my friend. Thank you so much. Ah. <coughs> <laughs> now we're going to get you well. I got your emojis. We just finished, just got back to the hotel after a completely successful vetting. Oh my God, I really want to honor Luke.
that this could not have happened without you. Every one of us would have left <laughs> that, <laughs> that situation. I am just super, super grateful for that. And I'm super grateful that we have an opportunity for people to see it because it helps people so much to know what's possible. The test we did yesterday is historic. Uh, I still am digesting it because it basically means the end of fossil fuels. I'd say the main thing that I have learned personally from this trip, it's more a reinforcement of something that I, I know, but you know, doubt now and then, is that whatever the question, the answer is always more love. Because our relationship with this inventor was on the rocks. You know, it was tempting to just say, hey, I came to help you. If you don't want it, we're out of here. And <laughs> I know from past experience that, you know, wait through that. That's not a great emotional place to make a decision from. And we just kept telling him the truth, even when he didn't believe it, and then loving him even when he couldn't allow it in. And at the end, being with us, he could see that, that number one, our motives were true. And number two, we were treating him with love. We've spent the last eight years traveling the globe in search of insights and technologies that could radically transform our world. And we found them. So why don't we all have access to these promising breakthroughs? We don't have access to these world-changing breakthroughs because we're not allowed to have them. Virtually every solution we found has been made illegal or suppressed, often violently. Maxwell's been imprisoned and tortured to try to get his secrets. And he and his first partner, before Genius, were both poisoned. Maxwell's still recovering from it, and his partner died. One of the... Of of the painful reality I have seen in the in energy is this is a very dangerous game altogether. Yeah, especially free energy because uh, um, you know, as I said, if they can try to 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 kill to kill it using professional people, and that has happened to me. I went through a lot poisons, like I'm saying right now. I'm fighting it. They come to you, then they said, no, you mustn't do this. Uh, when they see that, you know, you're, you're not giving up, then they can just frame you. Then they can say, no, you've done A, B, C. My prayer is this thing must save the light of the day. Innovators in any one sector often think that theirs is the only one being curtailed. That's not our conclusion. Dr. Young, whose non-pharmaceutical healing treatments were simple and effective, has also been imprisoned. This is the spot where I was arrested. So I had 13 counts of fraud, 12 counts of practicing medicine without a license, and one count of conspiracy. I was found guilty on two charges of practicing medicine without a license. So out of those 320 clients, I was found guilty on practicing medicine. The one was changing an IV, and the other one was removing an IV bag. So that's what I'm guilty of. Mm -hmm. The sentence was the, was the most extreme. 
was, it was 3.7 years. On our way to see Dr. Young, we randomly stopped at a coffee shop where we met a woman who had worked with him at his ranch. In my first week there, I delivered a plate of food to a resident in one of the trailers. And I remember seeing he had a tumor on the back of his head. After about a month or two, he had checked out. He was ready to go home. And there was nothing but a smooth piece of gauze there, like it had just melted away. Um, I remember just looking through the news one morning and seeing an article about a doctor from Valley Center who had been arrested or who was on trial. And when I clicked on it, I couldn't believe who it was. It just seemed, it makes me feel a bit emotional actually. It seemed very wrong for somebody who just wanted to heal and help people to be put through that. My approach is to educate and empower people on how to take care of their bodies. It's a self-care, self-care program. That we can have a debate is important. Uh, that we can talk about this openly uh, without being threatened on either side. When we first heard about Dr. Young, I looked him up on the internet and it made him look like such a quack. I called my friend who had initially turned me on to him to say, what's up with this guy? And he said, look, I traveled with him for a year and watched a lot of people, including my mother, heal from stage four metastasized cancer. You have to check him out. It's totally humbling to see how impactful it is when slander is used to marginalize these breakthroughs. Even I fell into it, and I've been slandered myself. So why and by whom are these innovations being suppressed? Is this just random bullying and corruption? According to our research, transformative breakthroughs in every sector are being systematically stifled in order to centralize authority. In our previous Thrive film, we detailed our conclusion that this suppression is the result of a well-organized agenda that is carried out through systems put in place at the highest levels of banking, government, medicine, food, energy, and information. Our investigations confirm that those seeking world domination sometimes referred to as the globalist cabal, have the goal to suppress innovations in order to manipulate what we have, what we know, and what we do. Their agenda is not a thriving world for everyone, but global control by an elite few. In Thrive One, we presented over 60 controversial facts detailing the structures and the strategies by which this agenda for control is being implemented. Not one of these facts has been successfully disputed. The globalist intent is to take down America and any other powerful country in order to establish, essentially, a universal banking corporation to rule the world. The agenda is playing out like clockwork as we navigate the measures put in place as a result of the coronavirus. Abiding by new government mandates makes sense to most people to protect against the spread of what we're told is an extremely contagious disease. But giving up rights has profound consequences under any circumstances. In fact, claiming our rights is at the core of our ability to get breakthrough innovations out to create vibrant local communities, and even to choose what we do with our own bodies. How does someone get a right? Who gives it? Who takes it away? The question of rights really revolves around the issue of authority. Authority means the right to rule, not just the ability to control somebody, but the right to forcibly dominate other people. So how does somebody get this legal authority, this right?
if I, as a single human being, can't legally stop you from taking a medicine that you believe will help you, then why and how does a government official claim the right to do it? There's both a rational and a moral incoherence here. If I don't have the moral right to do a certain thing, and my neighbor doesn't have the right to do it either, how could we possibly have given somebody else, government or anybody else, the right to do it? Morality doesn't work that way. If it's wrong for me and him and him and him and him and him, it's wrong for anybody, including government. Even if they have constitutions, even if they have elections, even if they call it legislation, it's still wrong. You can't make something bad into something good by doing a bunch of, of weird pseudo-religious rituals and calling it law. It's still wrong. The majority of people who enable uh, authoritarian injustice are not trying to be bad, but they've been taught to believe that obedience is a virtue, that paying your taxes is a good thing, that obeying the law is a good thing. And so you get a bunch of well-intentioned, decent people accidentally enabling evil because ruling classes don't pay for themselves. They don't fund themselves. You would never convince people to reach in their pockets and come up with the money to go invade seven countries in the Middle East. It would never happen without the notion of centralized authority as a state, as an authoritarian government. We've got clean ways to access energy, natural ways to prevent and heal illness, and tools to accelerate our expanding consciousness. And yet I believe unraveling this belief in authority holds the most important key to our survival. The government and the state is particularly challenging because it takes away the interpersonal nature of violence, which is one of the things that limits violence. So it's the outsourcing of violence which tends to make it escalate. Some people have the idea that if something is legal, it's moral. All of the persecution of the Jews in Nazi Germany were legal, but I think few people would say that it was moral. That's what government does. It tries to make immoral moral by giving it the blessing of legality. More than 200 million people were killed just by their own governments, not even counting war, in the last hundred years. And obviously that's not what proponents of government want. There are two giant cons. And if we understand these, we can understand the predicament we're in and the way to get free. The first one is the myth of authority. If you can convince people that someone should be ruling over them, then all you have to do is make sure you're the one. The second is money. Once you've secured the authority to rule over others, then you can take over the money system and manipulate it to maintain your control. With the monopoly on force, which governments have, and the ability to tax, and to print money, a small group can potentially take over everything and everyone. Despite their rhetoric, governments always look to expand their power and increase their control until people revolt. And when a revolution brings a new regime into power, it's not long until that regime begins to expand that power until the cycle just repeats all over again. Replace expand, revolt, repeat. Across the globe, people are frustrated and protesting, and they're frustrated with protesting. From Occupy, the Yellow Vests, and Hong Kong, to Venezuela, Brazil, China, Brexit, the United States, and countless others. What is the resolution that's missing? We propose that it's to reclaim individual sovereignty and create protective rules without any authoritarian rulers. We've come a long way from the pharaohs, kings, and dictators to the presidents, premiers, and prime ministers of today, but we're not there yet. 
Democracy, even if it were honest, is still majority or mob rule. You still have up to 49% dissatisfied. The one thing we haven't tried is true equality of opportunity based on non-aggression with everyone accountable for their actions and no one authorized to rule over anyone else. The idea of our being accountable to moral rules instead of rulers has been brewing for a long time. Epicurus called it natural justice. John Locke in the 1680s called it natural law, being all equal and independent. Herbert Spencer in the 1850s called it equal freedom. And Gandhi called it Hinswaraj, meaning self-governance. It's most commonly now referred to as the non-aggression principle, a simple rule where no one gets to initiate force against anyone else against their will except in true self-defense. When we put this principle to the test of ethics and of a universal morality, it holds up. It's the one thing we've found that everyone agrees on, at least for themselves. In the same way the Taurus is the universal basis for sustainable energy systems, the non-aggression principle seems to me to be the most coherent and logical candidate for the basis of a universal morality. Non-aggression is the social practice of resonance. What if the non-initiation of force was a universal constant for all human beings? Now, some people may violate it for sure, but what if it was understood as a moral law? What would change in our conception of society? Well, you can't have a state because the state violates the non-aggression principle. And people say, well, that's freaky. Absolutely. You know what else is freaky? Quantum physics. And if you don't want the effects of quantum physics, you can't use a cell phone. You can't use a computer because they run on some principles derived from quantum physics. What matters is, is it moral? Is it true? Is it valid? And it is. The non-aggression principle should be universal. We tell our kids, don't hit other children and don't take their stuff then our governments do exactly that. And with the majority of parents worldwide still claiming that a good hard spanking is sometimes necessary, we need to take a good hard look at why this violence is condoned. When it comes to the non-aggression principle, we should apply it the most to the greatest prevalence of violence and to society's most vulnerable members, which means that the non-aggression principle should apply first and foremost to the family. If children are raised peacefully, the odds of them becoming violent adults are virtually nil. If you want a peaceful world, you're treating children respectfully, peacefully. That is where the real gold of the future lies. The supposed legitimacy of some people having rights that we don't all have is so pervasive, so unquestioned, so woven into the fabric of our lives that to unpack it, let alone transform it, really requires shaking things up. It was my grandmother Amelia who taught me about critical thinking. She said, you have to be able to try on an idea like you try on an outfit in the store. You don't have to buy it. You can even take it home and then later return it. Well, she lived to be 103 and said there is no way she could have navigated all the changes that happened in her lifetime if she hadn't learned how to suspend disbelief and temporarily hold conflicting views long enough to determine the highest truth. So I've done that with the issue of unequal rights, the basis of authority. And the highest truth I've come up with is that equal individual accountability is the cornerstone of freedom and thriving. In fact, I believe integrity is to a person what resonance is to the field. The definition of integrity is the state of being whole 
and undivided, unified. Self-ownership is sort of a, a shorthand way to describe a very basic principle that almost everybody just understands instinctively. To say I own myself, it might sound a little bit schizophrenic, like I'm a table or something, but ownership means to have the exclusive right to decide what is done with something. And so when I say self-ownership, I just mean I get to decide what's done with this and what's done with my mind and my body and my, my time and my effort. And the same is true of every other individual. So most people instinctively grasp the concept of, of consent. And we all know that, but we're taught that there's an exception when it comes to the law and authority and government. This is especially clear with measures imposed to track and address COVID-19, including increased funding for the rollout of 5G that empowers the Internet of Things to turn what we think of as appliances into tracking devices in our homes and schools. There are known adverse health effects, especially to children of 5G, yet over 20,000 satellites are now set to blanket the globe, pulsing electromagnetic radiation from the ionosphere. The new 5G technology will also have millions of ground antenna, immersing people in a toxic sea of microwaves. If there's no voluntary choice, there's no self-ownership, no freedom. I'm not so sure that the, that the reason for rolling out 5G is connected to um, profit per se, but when you talk in terms of dragnet surveillance and being able to uh, dial into the frequency of a, an individual and to be able to target them in their own home and see them through steel and concrete from satellite 24 hours a day, we've taken electronic totalitarianism to its absolute acme point. Remember, Zenic technology has the potential to get us fast data transfer speed without these negative effects. A sovereign individual believes we own our own thoughts, our bodies, and the fruits of our labor. Being sovereign doesn't deny our social nature or our essential need and desire to care for one another. On the contrary, sovereignty is the foundation for all people having equal rights and equal opportunity. The drive towards centralizing authority over our lives shows up in every sector. In Thrive One, we created a checklist of what the globalists would need to control to achieve their goal of complete domination. Let's check in on the status of that. With energy, we showed that this elite cartel already controlled oil, gas, coal, and nuclear, and were suppressing new energy because it would undermine their consolidation of power. We came to see that in each sector, there's an escape route from the matrix, a release valve for humanity. And it's always characterized by strengthening individual sovereignty, decentralizing power, and harmoniously aligning with the principles of the field. our prior checklist for health. Except for natural and alternative treatments, the controlling elite have it all locked down. Currently, the risk involved in providing alternatives is serious. An inordinate number of holistic doctors in the U.S. have died mysteriously in the last several years, many of whom were working on natural cancer treatments or exposing the link between vaccines and brain damage. The other two most effective doctors we met whose results we saw curing cancer, including in some of our friends, are now in hiding in other countries after assassination attempts on their lives in the U.S. Efforts to centralize continue. The World Health Organization, the CDC, the Gates Foundation, Gavi, Microsoft, 
Google, GlaxoSmithKline, they're all in cahoots with this toxic totalitarian takeover. Amazon is becoming an online pharmaceutical dealer, which I suspect is part of what's behind their censoring information about natural remedies. Monsanto is now operating under the auspices of Bayer, so environmental toxins that make you sick and the companies who sell you drugs to manage the symptoms are all in one big funnel, which is why they're intimidating and eliminating those who would bring non-pharmaceutical natural healing. What's the relief valve? Freedom to explore ever new breakthroughs in biology, consciousness, and resonance for radiant health. When we were in China, we went to this city called Shenzhen, where the US and other countries are testing surveillance technologies under the Golden Shield program. These are the control tools that track people's every move to inform what is now known as the Chinese social credit system. Under this system, the government doles out or withholds normal rights, accessing your bank account, buying certain goods, or getting on a plane based on obedience to the state. This is technocracy run amok. This is scientific dictatorship. The gift of life is calling and guiding us toward harmonious fulfillment of our human potential for creativity, cooperation, and love. Not to surrender our conscious evolution to sociopathic control freaks or artificial intelligence robots. We have to consciously change course to avoid this same rollout everywhere. Especially in the aftermath of COVID-19, which is being used to collapse economies, expand surveillance, impose universal vaccines, and justify global governance. When I was vetting the new health technologies, I noticed that many of the patients who were willing to explore the bold new approaches were the ones who had already exhausted traditional options, and they were in stage four metastasized cancer. I would say that right now, life on this planet is in stage four metastases. It's time to get bold. When we dare to go deep enough down the rabbit hole to truly understand what is going on in the darkness behind closed doors, it empowers us with the information we need to solve the huge problems we face. There is light at the end of the rabbit hole. Everywhere there's a problem, there are people working diligently and effectively to solve it. People around the world are waking up to this issue of informed consent. And more and more cities and counties are banning the dumping of brain-damaging fluoride into their water supplies. Perpetrators are getting exposed as they're going for official approval to do legally the atmospheric aerosol dumping that they've been doing covertly for more than two decades. And as a result of organized pressure from people impacted by Monsanto Bear's glyphosate herbicide, it was finally reclassified as a carcinogen. Now it, along with more and more genetically modified crops, is being banned from counties and countries around the world. Protests are also emerging worldwide against the involuntary, sickening radiation that comes with 5G. The common theme to all of these solutions is restoring the wholeness of natural systems. One of the most far-reaching actions we can take is to support organizations and countries working to establish legal rights for nature. It would significantly help limit pollution and restore ecosystems. Of course, we all need to access resources from our environment to survive but we can prevent the destruction of ecosystems in the process. And we need to. All life matters. Centralized money is pretty much the linchpin of the entire domination agenda. Primary perpetrators tend to be in the financial industry because it's the money that gives them the ability to control politicians 
who control the military, who control people. They've almost completed their plan to have the entire world funneled through one debt-based fiat currency system. The countries attacked in the Middle East under the guise of so-called regime change, since being invaded, all have Rothschild central banks. When General Wesley Clark returned to the Pentagon in 2002, after his retirement, he had a shocking experience. The only countries which have not been absorbed into this banking scheme are in the crosshairs, Iran, North Korea, and Cuba. Having money backed by something real, known as asset-backed currency, prevents the global cabal from controlling people through money they can just make up out of nothing, the basis of what's known as fiat currency. Countries all over the world are increasing their use of gold-backed money to help prevent this takeover. While their goal may not be equal rights for all, they are at least after a multipolar world, unlike the globalists who want to rule it all. Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa have created an alliance that represents a bloc close to the size of NATO and nearly half of gross domestic production across the planet. They're doing multi-billion dollar deals, especially for oil, that are being settled in gold and gold-backed yuan, the currency of China. At their invitation, Kimberly and I met with various leaders of the Asian Dragon Alliance, an ancient confederation of royal families from China, Japan, Indonesia, the Philippines, and Vietnam. This alliance is spearheading a return to asset-backed currencies worldwide. They've been mining and collecting off-record gold troves for centuries. They helped to create the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, backed by $200 billion in gold, as an alternative to the IMF and World Bank, which have destroyed the economies of so many countries with their unrepayable loans. They've also helped to create the Shanghai Gold Exchange, which deals in real precious metal assets rather than the fiat paper scams by which big banks have been manipulating metals markets for years. Fortunately, decentralized alternatives are emerging. Innovators all over the world are creating authentic blockchain and asset-backed alternative currencies. Constricting information through one centralized source is the antithesis of how the field works and how sustainable systems really work. Our education, media, and even our scientific inquiry are funneled through the same centralized control grid. Just as alternative technologies are being kept from us, so are alternative perspectives. One curriculum taught, one scientific worldview accepted. Left and right media are essentially owned and sponsored by the same handful of companies, and censorship is ramping up daily. What's being censored? The people and content that would empower us as individuals with information and tools that support our freedom. The ultimate empowering of individuals happens with information. The unified field itself is essentially an information transfer system at every scale. Constant feedback is what enables any system to thrive, be it a body, an organization, an ecosystem, or a civilization. The battles of everyday people have so far kept the internet open and free enough 
that countless truth media sources are becoming available that are beyond partisan politics in their authentic search for facts, evidence, and common sense. The following of many of them is rivaling and surpassing that of so-called mainstream news. As effective as the consolidation has been, there are many areas where the agenda is being revealed and people are refusing to tolerate it. So far, we've been effective against governments and corporations who try to get RFID chips into our bodies, by which they could further track and control us. There are growing movements to expose pedophilia rings and stop child sex trafficking in Canada, the Netherlands, Australia, Belgium, the UK, the US, and elsewhere. In addition to the horrific abuse of innocent children, these networks are used by the cabal to get photos of influential people engaged in sex with minors, which they use as blackmail to keep the control agenda in place. Also on the progress list, even before the closing of schools in the 2020 pandemic, there were already increasing educational options to replace the mandatory indoctrination of traditional government schools. And through the hard work and tenacity of independent journalists and truth seekers, marginalized topics are now beginning to go mainstream. Even the New York Times, CNN, and the Vatican have all finally confirmed that yes, there are videos and other official sightings of UFOs, and that whoever is making these ships has capabilities way beyond anything in the known military fleet. There's a whole fleet of them. Look on the NSA. Oh my gosh. They're all going against the wind. The wind's 120 knots to the west. Look at that thing, dude. This was extremely abrupt, like a ping pong ball bouncing off a wall. The ability to hover over the water and then start a vertical climb from basically zero up towards about 12,000 feet and then accelerate in less than two seconds and disappear is mm -hmm. something I had never seen in my life. While we are making progress on many fronts, the reality of our global interconnectedness is very different from a global government. A global government would need to get all of us to financially support it. Fear of a global pandemic can increase people's willingness to buy into this global authority. Anyone concerned about the risks of forfeiting rights is shamed for not caring about the health of their fellow citizens. Just like anyone questioning the science behind the failing global warming models or mentioning the obvious role of the sun is condemned for not caring about the environment. As we laid out in Thrive One, the globalist end goal is to centralize law, money, and police enforcement into one totalitarian command structure with energy as its control currency. This centralization goes by many names. Agenda 21, 2030, global governance, the New World Order, all under the guise of the Rothschild Rockefeller created United Nations. Free energy would do more to obsolete toxic fossil fuel emissions than anything on the table. There are ways to address our obvious need to control pollution without creating a tax base for global tyranny. Giving up our rights for the supposed good of the group appeals to our natural compassion and goodness and leads to our own demise. The core struggle for a thriving civilization is not between nations, political parties, races, genders, or classes, but between those who want to be free and those who would continue to steal freedom from us. The justification for initiating violence comes in different forms, but the outcome is always the same. The Nazis endorsed it for racial preference. The communists condoned it on behalf of a social class. The social democracies claim the right to initiate force whenever they deem it serves the common good. By giving up our authority, 
and allowing ourselves to be controlled by unethical policies instead of rational, moral principles, we find ourselves in a situation where energy is controlled, health options are inadequate, media is censored, money is centralized, education is limited, and now our ability to control our own businesses, our property, and ourselves is at stake. The definition of socialism is government taking over the means of production. That means all products and services, transportation, education, manufacturing, food, agriculture, media, energy, money, healthcare, and more. In recent times, it's democratic socialism that's touted as the system by which most people will be cared for and prosper. But systems based on unequal rights will never meet the needs of most people in the long run. It doesn't work that way. Millions of people throughout the United States and all over the world rely on government for their basic needs. The point isn't to abandon these people. It's to develop strategies for transition to a free world that empowers them. Instead of additional taxes, which social democracy relies on, why don't we require that our tax money be redirected away from wars of aggression to provide goods and services to those who genuinely need them, along with training that could empower those who can to become independent? More than 100 million people were starved, tortured, and killed under the socialist regimes of Hitler's Germany, Stalin's Russia, Mao's China, Pol Pot's Cambodia, Kim Jong-un's North Korea, Chavez's Venezuela. This isn't what social democrats want, but as Chairman Mao said, relinquishing our self-rule and freedom to innovate into the hands of government is the stepping stone to communism, where instead of just controlling everything, the government also owns it. Pro-socialists of any age either don't know about this or they somehow believe this time it will be different. Promising to provide free health care and services for those in need with money from wealthy people is how all the socialist regimes started. History proves this. Clearly, there are a ton of people in need on our planet. Empowering them with long-term, self-sustaining solutions, that's our real challenge. It's not a problem of just lacking enlightened leadership. The fundamental violation at the basis of socialism is a fatal systemic, moral, and economic flaw. The solutions to virtually all our problems come through alignment with the flow of the energy in the field. Centralization of power and restriction of information are the exact opposites of what works. After two decades of research into these questions, I'm confident that all of the challenges we face are way better served by independent providers in a true free market than by a small group with a monopoly on force and money. This is the essence of voluntarism, a principle for organizing that finally transcends the political polarization, the struggle for power over others that threatens our very existence. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Imagine a future civilization with protective rules, yet without rulers. With no authoritarian rule of government, imagine what goes away. Imagine it.
The pain of our current inequality and planetary destruction cannot legitimately be laid at the feet of capitalism because we don't have free market capitalism. We have state intervention, centrally controlled, subsidy ridden, bailout backed, military enforced, banker skewed, legalized corruption, crony corporatism. To call what we have capitalism is an insult to honest workers, managers, entrepreneurs, and investors, whether it's Steve Jobs, Oprah Winfrey, or your children at their lemonade stand. It is as arrogant, unjust, and dangerous to try to centrally manage an economy as it is to try to geoengineer the weather. A decentralized, unsubsidized economy is a natural phenomenon. People fulfill each other's needs through billions of daily voluntary exchanges. Just moving in this direction of mutual benefit and natural pricing has improved more people's standard of living than anything in history. So who do you think should rule? One person, a small group, a majority, or should we each rule ourselves as long as we don't violate anyone else? Virtually everyone I've talked with says the latter. Understanding the myth of authority doesn't mean we can snap our fingers and just hope destructive corporations will stop plundering the planet on their own accord. Until we have true, enforceable personal accountability, some of these corporations need to be constrained. And at this stage, it's government regulations we necessarily rely on to constrain them, even though it's government protection that gives them the power to do the damage in the first place. Another strategic step we can take to help empower individuals is to overturn what's called corporate personhood. In 2010, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in the Citizens United case that corporations can have the same rights as an individual human. They can donate any amount of money to political campaigns based on the premise that money equals free speech. As a result, Politicians often spend up to 70% of their time going after corporate campaign dollars and then doing whatever it takes to be accountable to the donors. Not to us and not to our planet. Whoa, what if we don't tolerate this? The non-aggression principle does not count on good behavior from everyone. Quite the contrary. Individual accountability enforced by rules curtails bad behavior. Unlike what we have now that essentially rewards corruption and promotes those who best serve the controlling agenda. All of these deceptive and coercive funnels lead to the inevitable suffering and death that socialism, communism, and fascism inflict. Government expands its power at the expense of individuals because protecting itself is its primary job. The job of enlightened rules is to protect people and the planet. The transition toward a condition of true freedom and ultimately a rules but no rulers, stateless society is happening naturally and as fast as it is allowed. In the United States, already over 90% of civil cases are resolved through alternative dispute mediation rather than the government courts. I was astounded and encouraged to learn that there are already more independent peacekeepers in malls, corporations, hotels, schools, and communities than there are government police. Not only do the rest of us vastly outnumber the perpetrators of the global domination agenda, 
by more than a million to one, but the unified field itself is on our side. Truth, reason, virtue, compassion, these are the real life superpowers that emerge when you align with the field. On the other hand, those who would want to control or destroy us, they're trying to go up against the entire unified field. Principles, not politics, are the way out. The existence of a field, our relationship to the field, the ability to tap the potential of the field is what gives us the evolutionary edge that our ancestors never had. The edge to not only survive, but to thrive in the existence of the new world that's emerging the new world that you and I are designing because now we know about the field. There are big systemic changes needed, and it's easy to wonder how to begin. I think the place to begin anything is with ourselves. Like the vast consciousness we exist within, it starts with purpose. Our sector solutions wheel covers every area of human endeavor. So once you have found your purpose and the sector you are most drawn to, then look at issues in that area to identify which one best matches your skills and passion. Next, consider which level of engagement best suits you right now. Is it working to meet immediate needs, like helping someone who's hungry to get food? Improving systems, like helping to create easier access to a broad range of health treatments? Or is it shifting consciousness, helping to refine the worldview that is at the root of them all? Aligning with the unified field can lead to an experience of resonance that we call love. Not a romantic crush kind of love, but the big love, coming into harmony with the life force itself. Applying reason and practice to unleashing our spiritual essence is what I call the science of love. A finite set of skills to access this state of harmony. These skills are physical, emotional, mental, and interpersonal. And it's possible to get good enough at each of them to experience a deeply fulfilling and effective life. I believe these skills are not only obtainable, but in fact, evolving new abilities is ordained in our evolutionary code. So what does it take? A clear destination, freedom, a map of how to get there, the arc of process, a compass, the non-aggression principle, and a strategy, restoring wholeness to natural systems, aligning with the field. We were born to do this. We were born to thrive. The same way there's no magic pill that can cure us if we don't deal with our lifestyle, I don't believe there's any one person or group, let alone some Marvel superhero, who can solve all our problems. I just don't think we can outsource that capacity. So what it means is that we're all in charge of coming up with this stuff ourselves. And as daunting as it can feel, it's actually good news. Because if it weren't up to us, we'd be powerless. And we're not. We are as powerful as we allow ourselves to be. We're not alone in this. We are profoundly connected. Science and spirit both show that now. And as the poet Rumi reminds us, remember, you're not just a drop in the ocean. You're the ocean in a drop.
cycles repeating, the earth is speaking, saying time has come to wake up from this nightmare of lies. So many shattered lives reaching out, crying, crying out for freedom. Crying out for love Carried by a current To a stand side by side On the brink of a brand new dawn We come together while the waters rise There's a stirring deep inside Deep inside We come together to stand up for our life take to thrive while we've been sleeping our hearts were beating so much closer than we ever knew beneath the noise there is an inner voice whispering clear and true the veils are finally lifting the waves becoming clear It's a dream without a limit and a vision so strong. Every person knows they belong. They come together while the waters rise. There's a stirring deep inside. Deep inside. They come together to stand up for our life. Does it take to fly? Come together while the waters rise. There's a stirring deep inside. Deep inside. We're coming together to stand up for our life. What on earth does it take to fly? We come together to stand up for our life. We all have what it takes to thrive. Come together while the waters rise. There's a stirring deep inside. We come together to stand up for our life. What it takes to thrive We come together while the waters rise There's a stirring deep inside We come together to stand up for our lives We all have what it takes to thrive We all have what it takes to thrive We all have what it takes to thrive.